Greetings, parish orphans and retrogrades. Pope Francis has recently corroborated a longtime story circulated among myself and other traditional Catholics to the effect that there was some amount of skullduggery at the 2005 and the 2013 synods. The 2005 Synod, of course, gave us Benedict XVI as Pope 265. And the 2013 Synod gave us Francis I as Pope number 266. In an article out yesterday on LifeSite, it reads, Pope Francis has confirmed prior information that he was a close contender to Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger during the 2005 papal conclave, while also claiming he was used by other cardinals and that he himself would have voted for the future Benedict XVI. So the fact that he came second in the 2005 conclave voting has long been reported by traditional Catholics and traditional adjacent Catholics. It's part of an important part of the story of the Sankt Gallen Mafia, which you've heard all about from Ms. Mrs. Julia Maloney on this channel and other channels as she's told us all what she's learned about the Mafia Club that had planned for decades to elect Francis I. Now, that wasn't at first Bergoglio, it seems like the initial plan was for Francis I to be Cardinal Carlo Martini, who was the head of the Sankt Gallen Mafia. So it was essentially, starting in the 90s, a club that centered around the action item, make me Pope, guys. Martini had a mafia club, so they would meet in Sankt Gallen, Switzerland, that essentially was how to get me to be Pope at the voting at the 2005 conclave. This is to say that according to one of the mafia members, Cardinal Gottfried Daniels, he admitted they started meeting in 96 every year. I think he said they would meet yearly and it turns out they probably meant more than yearly, but who knows. And they met all the way up until 2005. They probably thought JP2 was on his way out in the late 90s because of the Parkinson's. And he hung around so long. He stuck around for so very long that it ended up being basically on the 10th year of what would have been the Sankt Gallen Mafia's meetings. JP2 finally succumbed to his Parkinson's. Well, in that time, the leader of the Mafia Club, who was saying, pick me, pick me, pick me, make me Pope, also succumbed or was succumbing to the same Parkinson's disease. And so at that 2005 conclave, where the prior main goal of the St. Gallen Mafia for about 10 years had been anyone but Ratzinger, we need to avoid a Ratzinger pontificate. Ratzinger, of course, ended up being Pope, so they failed ostensibly, but, but not in a major way because second in voting, according to these longtime trad Catholic sources, was a man named Bergoglio that was little known. The little knowniness of Bergoglio fetching such triumphalistic results, number two, behind the, the you know, long time guy behind the guy in the Vatican, Vatican II father, one of the few knowers of the secret of Fatima, number two behind JP2, main man. The only other guy, the, the, the close number two in all that voting was a total unknown named Bergoglio from Buenos Aires. And he finished number two. Bergoglio now, sorry, Francis, now seems to confirm this. Furthermore, between the third and the fourth scrutinies or votes taken at that 2005 conclave, 
they had lunch. And at a famous lunchtime vignette, Julia Maloney reports that Martini and hated Ratzinger were seen walking arm in arm. And after that meeting, they returned from lunch, took the fourth scrutiny, which saw all of the Sankt Gallen votes turning in favor of Ratzinger was a deal struck. This has been the long time whispered thing among trads. It's odd then, now I'm getting back to the LifeSite article, to turn to our Pope who's been in the chair Peter for 11 years, corroborating much of this stuff. In that conclave, the data is known, he says. They used me. In that conclave, the data is known. They used me. Pope Francis says in a preview chapter released Easter Sunday ahead of the April 3rd publication of the book, The Successor, detailing his relationship with Benedict XVI. That's very interesting in this preview chapter. The preview chapter contains information regarding the 2005 conclave, of course, which I'm reading from the LifeSite article, which saw the election of Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger as Pope Benedict XVI. Having been created cardinal in 01, Bergoglio participated in the 2005 conclave as an elector. While the previewed, sorry, while the revealed passages have caused unsurprising controversy, some aspects appear to contradict prior accounts. So that's what today's show will be about. How do they contradict prior accounts? How do they corroborate prior accounts? Let's get to it in a second. First, I want to, now that it is springtime in full swing, Anticipation of summer in full swing, which is basically what spring always is. Encourage you all to go to realestateforlife.org if you live in any blue state. Now the economy is largely online. So many more people now than 10 years ago work online and you can basically live where you want to live. That should not be any blue state. Get to a red state today if you live in a blue state this is not people who watch the show know just some flimsy endorsement that I make. I say, get out of your blue state, get to a red state, go to realestateforlife.org because it's most important to the life of yourself and your family and maybe even the, the kind of post-Americana world that we're in now that you get out and get someplace more approximating a true republic, a small red state hopefully in the American Southeast. That's what I did, and that's why I plug this so much, because everyone knows that this is that I say what I mean. I know where I speak. Also, if you want to support the channel, you do not need to do so monetarily. It's nice if you do so monetarily. If you want to do so monetarily, go to Locals or Subscribe Star attached to this video and give 10 bucks a month. That's awesome. But even more fundamental, if you can't afford that, please subscribe. Please subscribe to this channel. If you watch all my videos, and I do this too, I do this with a lot of basketball vids, I, I better subscribe to the channel. I ask people, if you watch like video after video of rules for retrogrades, subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell. It is convenient for you, but it's, it's very helpful for me. Like this video, leave a comment. Now, in what way was Bergoglio, quote unquote, used in 2005's conclave? Back to the LifeSite article published yesterday. It happened that I got to have 40 of the 115 votes in the Sistine Chapel, Francis stated. 40 out of 115, relatively unknown. These guys are not supposed to be canvassing. And he admits he, he made about the amount I supposed he did. And he was getting, I believe, more before that lunchtime meeting. He states this in the book. I had 40 out of 115 votes in the Sistine Chapel. About this second round of votes in 05. Sorry, I thought that was the total. They were, an, they were enough to stop Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger's candidacy because if they had continued to vote for me, he would not have been able to reach the two-thirds necessary to be elected. Okay, so that's the second scrutiny. He's at 40 out of 115. The Argentine pontiff continued, 
expanding on a statement that he was used by certain unnamed cardinals during the 2005 conclave to ruin the chances of a Ratzinger election. Here's what he said precisely. The move was to put my name on it, block Ratzinger's election, and then negotiate a third different candidate. They told me later that they did not want a Pope foreigner. The idea was to block the election of Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. They used me, but behind, they were already thinking of proposing another cardinal. They still disagreed on who, but were about ready, or were already about to release a name. End quote. So you see, pamphleteering, canvassing, lobbying does happen. For all of the papal maximalists and, and, and papalatrists and Pope splainers out there who are like, they go in, in all white outfits with all white gloves, chanting perfectly, angelically, into the Sistine Chapel, and they pray and fast and wait for the Holy Spirit to, via interior locution, whisper a name. And that's how papal maximalists think this happens. No, it happens through politicking. The church is a divine institution, but it's also a human institution. That's the mystery. Many of these cardinals are bad guys. You now know that. And the bad guys tend to be the ones that are the most canting. They're the canting ones, just as they are at WEF and UN and UNESCO and all of the organizations that are now so close to the church, thanks to... Bergoglio slash Francis. And Francis admits it. And it even sounds like he's on his way to saying that this was done by the third or the fourth scrutiny, which is what I've always been told by Mrs. Maloney. So don't be shocked or scandalized to learn that the church, yes, it's a divine institution, meaning it enjoys some divine protections, but it's also human, and its human agency is corrupted in the same way that bad men are corrupted, and there are bad men within the church, and that's not new. From Judas onward, there are bad men in the church. There are very good men in the church. The church clergy produces usually the holiest saints, but it also has some very bad men, and those bad men can elect another bad man in theory. I don't know if I'm being too specific here, but it can happen. It does happen. It has happened multiple times, not just in 2013. So don't, this affects the very ab initio from the beginning narrative on how we got Pope Francis affects root and branch the way that we talk about him today in his, the beginning of his 12th year of his pontificate. You see? The papalatrists think like he was whispered by a dove into the ear of each of these men, and they all had no agenda for where the pontificate went. Instead, there was a very real, very leftist agenda from St. Gallen, Switzerland, that seems to be at one with the World Economic Forum, with the One World Government, with the deep state. The deep church is real. And it aims to be aligned with the deep state and personnel is policy. So don't be scandalized. Don't clutch at your pearls. If you're wearing them, keep wearing them, but don't clutch at them. The article continues. Analyzing the Pope's remarks about details of the 2005 conclave, some have expressed concern about his detailing of the voting numbers. Under the terms of JP2's University Dominici Gregis, governing papal conclaves, all the participating cardinals swear an oath to, quote, maintain rigorous secrecy with regard to all matters in any way re related to the election of the Roman pontiff or those which, by their very nature, during the vacancy of the apostolic see, call for the same secrecy. Now, that, that, could, be, that could be more clear, because which matter actually call for secrecy. Not so obvious to all of us. Paragraph 58 of Universi 
diminishing egregious, notes that additional individuals associated with the election, quote, who directly or indirectly could in any way violate secrecy, whether by words or by writing, by signs or in any other way, are absolutely obliged to avoid this, lest they incur the penalty of excommunication, late sententiae reserved to the apostolic see, end quote. Francis alluded to this penalty, stating that cardinals swear not to reveal what is happening in the conclave, but the popes are licensed to count it. Hmm. So I think I know why Francis is doing this. I'll tell you if I'm right as I read on. Papal relations with canon law have long been a subject of particular interest and often confusion. But canon lawyers have noted that since the Pope can grant permission to cardinals to reveal details about the conclave, he himself can do legally likewise in terms of discussing such details. In fact, the details about the 2005 conclave votes as recounted by Francis are already in the public sphere, though perhaps little known. Papal biographer Austin Ivere presented them shortly after Francis's 2013 election, citing the now editorial manager of the Vatican Dicastery for communication. So also did historian and dictator Pope author Henry Sear, who cited longtime Vatican journalist and friend of Bergoglio, Lucio Brunelli. Quote, Despite the rules of strict secrecy, it was revealed after the 2005 conclave that the obscure Jesuit Archbishop of Buenos Aires, Jorge Mario Bergoglio, had been runner-up, Sear wrote. Before detailing, Bergoglio had received 40 votes compared to Ratzinger's 72 votes on the penultimate ballot. So according to this, there were only three scrutinies, not four. Maybe I'm just misremembering it from Julian Maloney. I knew there were three or four. Ivory's article has since been removed from the public sphere, though it is found in the Internet Archive. Now, if you go read the first edition of his book, which I believe was pulled off the shelves after about a week, maybe a little less. And my friend Pat Coffin has this first edition, or you could read it on the Internet Archive. It does, in fact, have some extra juiciness. Francis also attested in the new book that those who had quote, used him were seeking to prevent then Cardinal Ratzinger from achieving the two-thirds vote necessary to be elected Pope. That's interesting. So that's not what my theory was, why Francis is say, speaking out now. That's not what it was. I'll always tell you whether I was right or wrong. I didn't want to waste time. It was actually wrong. I thought he was approaching this to condemn the good guys who might be digging around at this point. I was wrong. He's, he's condemning the people that made him Pope eventually, or at least made him second, first runner-up in 2005. I thought that was the same set of agents within the Cardinalate that made him Pope eventually in 2013. Maybe, I, mean, I don't know, the plot thickens. As, he's already, as has already been highlighted, such a comment does not align with the rules governing the conclave in 05. JP2's UDG document, under which the 2005 conclave was held, states that a pope is elected by a simple absolute majority, namely over 50%, which would not require a two-thirds majority. Benedict XVI later reinstituted the two-thirds majority needed to elect a pope in June of 2007. Um, now, there is this idea that has been floated by members of the Sankt Gallen Mafia to even secular periodicals and publications that Ratzinger would be a transitional pope. Don't get excited out there, people that love dysphoria. That's not what it is. A transitional pope, not long. He was under 10 years. But at the time... Some were boasting that his pontificate would be even shorter than the eight years it occupied. In the preview chapter, back to the LifeSide article, in the preview chapter of the book, Francis appears aggrieved at being, quote, used by the unnamed group of cardinals against Ratzinger, who I, I've always thought, I've long thought were Francis's friends. I think they are. Let's see. He states further that he himself had voted for Ratzinger, 
According to Francis, the unnamed group of cardinals only stopped strategically using Bergoglio in the 2005 conclave when he let it be known that he would not accept if he was elected pope. Boom. That's interesting. This could be politicking. I'm not saying boom because I necessarily even believe him. Because I don't. Francis likes power. He likes the exercise of power. He likes the flex of power. He likes the feel of it. So I'm not saying I believe him, but that's big, that he's saying that the, he's not using the name. The St. Gallen Mafia used him to overshadow Ratzinger for a, for a time, but then he said, I don't want to be Pope, and then they dropped him. Well, that seems to contradict the other thing he said about um, they're going to put forward some third candidate. So that's kind of weird. He already seems to be contradicting himself, but this is still very juicy and interesting. Expanding on his reasons for supporting Ratzinger, Borgoglio appeared to echo the already well-documented aims and phraseology of the Sankt Golan Mafia by expressing his wish for a transitional pope in the 2005 conclave. This is... This is... Borgoglio Francis himself. Direct quote. He, Ratzinger was the only one who could be Pope at the time. After the revolution of John Paul II, who had been a dynamic pontiff, very active, with initiative, who traveled, it was necessary a Pope to maintain a healthy balance, a transitional Pope. Okay, so now Francis stops sounding like he's striking out at the St. Gallen Mafia agenda, and now it sounds like he's in some unexpected way, still concomitant with it. But, but while, while sort of condemning it and saying, I feel used. Plot thickens further. While the Sankt Gallen Mafia were campaigning hard against Ratzinger during the 05 conclave, once elected, they resigned themselves, once he was elected, they resigned themselves to the result and began to refer to him as a transitional figure, a phrase employed by Francis in the preview chapter. So he's using this weird, weird point of view, where he sounds like he's not with the Sankt Gallen crew, but he really is, and he's not actually severing ties. Francis attested in the book that he was happy Ratzinger had been elected in 2005 rather than himself, since, quote, if they had chosen one like me, who is in a lot of trouble, I couldn't have done anything. At that time, it would not have been possible, end quote. So it doesn't sound like he was used in the, the very next section in the article is called used or not. It sounds like, yes, they employed his popularity or what have you temporarily to, to block Ratzinger for a while maybe to swing a deal or not. I don't know. I'm not saying they did. I'm not saying they didn't, but that's one of the ideas out there in the public forum, that they swung a deal at lunch in between these two scrutinies, penultimate and ultimate scrutinies. And um, they just, what I, what I think if this deal happened, not sure that it did, what would have been the terms of the deal is, you can be Pope now in 2005. We, the real revolutionaries, think we need a transitional Pope anyway. You're the last pope who will resemble stasis, staying power, homeostasis, in the Roman Catholic Church. And then our number 266, I guess we know it won't be Cardinal Martini now, but he will be called Francis I. I guess it'll be Bergoglio. He seems to be popular enough to come in second place. We do know that he will be a revolutionary and he's going to change things and he's going to remake the church. Give him five years and he'll remake the church. Remember when Uncle Ted McCarrick admitted this after Francis was elected in 2013? He said, if we give this guy four or five years, he can remake the whole church. That's why they wanted a transitional figure. So even though Francis is complaining about being used, really? You just admitted that they needed this Ratzinger transitional figure that they originally launched the St. Gallen Mafia to avoid, they're like, okay, we'll roll with it. We'll have him for under 10 years, and then we'll be ready for a revolution. 
used or not. In the previous chapter, Francis appears as one who was unwilling to cooperate in the plans of others during 2005. But Bergoglio was described by Henry Sear as having returned to his native Argentina following the 05 conclave with the air of being nearly Pope. Hmm. That's a direct quote from Sear. Sear writes in The Dictator Pope that Bergoglio was at the very least cooperating with the Sankt Gallen Mafia Cardinals to be elected in 2005 and was, according to Sear's account, sorry, dispirited afterwards due to his failure. In the years leading up to the 05 conclave, Bergoglio's fame and influence spread both in Latin America and in Rome. See, now this contradicts what they're calling an obscure, they called him an obscure pope in the same article about three paragraphs above, and everyone always says, in 2005, he was still obscure. So this is both self-contradictory and contradictory of the public record to call him famous and, and having influence by 05. By 2005, a report which noted Bergoglio as the chief rival to Ratzinger in the 05 conclave declared that, quote, his star shone in Rome and left, quote, a favorable impression as a man open to communication and dialogue. Boy, you guys screwed the pooch on that one. Ratzinger is a man open to communication and dialogue? This is a man who, when he was so mad at the 1415 twin synods, once was red-faced, screaming about the conservative cardinals, avoiding, averting the Casper plan, which ended up getting enforced anyway. But he was so mad that Burke and others and Mueller were avoiding communion for the divorce and civilly remarried. He passed out at dinner in front of a bunch of people and he was red-faced and they thought he was dead for 10 minutes. A rage-filled tyrant of a man who hates open communication and dialogue and who uses intrigue and every manner of politics and just screaming and interrupting, according to many reports that come out, to avoid letting his opponents be heard. They really screwed the pooch on that one. That same report recounted how, quote, Bergoglio is not a theologian or an outstanding intellectual nor a polyglot, although he can cope with foreign languages, but he moves in all milieu securely and ably, especially in Rome, end quote. That is called Romanita. If you talk to any priest in Rome, a, a pontiff needs Romanita, they'll say. He needs to be able to manipulate. Bergoglio was seen as highly attractive choice by many of the cardinals in 05, wrote Austin Ivory in 2013, especially after, his, after Cardinal Carlo Maria Martini withdrew his name from the consideration citing illness. That was his Parkinson's. The now widely attested account of Bergoglio's near rise to the papal throne in 2005 was largely forgotten in the clamor surrounding the new Pope Benedict XVI. And in the lead up to the 2013 conclave, most news reports were too focused on the details of a shock resignation to seriously recall the leading contenders from 05. That's an interesting point. I mean, when did Ratzinger announce, sorry, Benedict announced that he was going to quit? February 27th? When was he elected? March uh, Francis elected March 13th. So you had, I mean, you had two weeks to, to kind of weather shield against that shock. I don't, I don't know how reasonable it is to give this account that LifeSite gives here. Most news reports were too focused on the details of a shock resignation to seriously recall the leading contenders of 05. But speaking to LifeSite News, Sear took issue with the claims made by Francis in the preview chapter of the new book. While stating that Cardinal Bergoglio did not enter the 2005 conclave with a thought of becoming Pope, Sear suggested that it is another question how he responded when a strong group began to put him forward. That's a good point. That's a good point, Sear makes. You can always do the George Washington thing, I don't want to be president. You write it in letters to your friends because you know they'll be in the national museums and things like that. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean much. It doesn't mean, look, he really didn't want to be Pope. I, I don't buy it. The man loves power. Quoting 
A line from his own book about the 2013 conclave, Sears stated, the liberal cardinals thought that they were using Bergoglio. It is more likely that he was using them. The same judgment is applicable with adjustment to 2005. Francis Bergoglio could have been using them. Who came out with power? Same thing I always say. I was saying this on the phone yesterday. Why do hyper-papalist Catholics, anytime anything bad happens, they shift, they flip the world upside down, the benefit-burden continuum, and if the Pope does something bad, which is very frequent in this pontificate, they say, oh, he must have some bad advisors. No, 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 no. When you're in charge, everything's your fault. Even very remote, not proximate, ill consequences, seemingly not related to you, end up being blamed on you, especially the ones directly that you ordered. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. So Francis is responsible for all things, and it looks like he's responsible for even the skullduggery, if you take Henry Sear seriously. Commenting on Francis's claim that he was used in 05, Sear points to a diary the diary of an anonymous cardinal from the conclave. I think, I think this is an anonymous French cardinal, if I remember correctly, which detailed Bergoglio's accumulation of 39 votes. Quote, how Bergoglio responded to this situation is a mystery which no one not present at the conclave could claim to answer, said Sear. However, he added, it should be seen in the light of Bergoglio's habitual way of acting, which has always been to avoid committing himself openly. Sound familiar? Fiducia supplicants, Amoris Laetitia, uh, Carita Amazonia, vis-a-vis -vis women deacons, 2023 Synod, has always been to avoid committing himself openly. And he takes a position, customarily, which allows him to be seen as acceptable to either side. Sound familiar? This is the heart of what he learned from Juan Perón, Peronism should be acceptable to either side. This is the man, Bergoglio. Sear continued, stating that even more relevant is Bergoglio's ample track record of manipulating the truth in retrospect, and in particular the story of how he dismissed Mr. Batazzi from his staff, which I recount on page 34 of um, Dictator Pope. The possibility of total falsification on the part of the present Vicar of Christ would not be at all out of character. And, and this article ends abruptly. So I think what Sear was saying then, it applies now, is that there's nuggets of truth in this. Francis has, for instance, now vindicated the claim that he did come second, that there was a group, the Falcon Mafia, who wanted him to at least challenge Ratzinger in 05, and who probably wanted him to prevail in 2013, which ended up happening, but he might have been pulling their strings rather than they his. That's all Sears saying. And Francis, now, in this forthcoming book, we got a glimpse at the third chapter, shouldn't be expected to be telling the truth. The important parts are more in what he corroborated than what he contradicted. He corroborates that the Sankt Gallen Mafia is absolutely real, it's not much of a needed corroboration because we've had so many mafia members themselves and so many fellow travelers themselves, like Austin Ivory, recount the St. Gallen Mafia is real in so many terms. Gottfried Daniels put it in his autobiography, gave a bunch of interviews. You can go watch them still where he says, oh, we called ourselves the Mafia Club. Walter Casper has made fleeting references to it. He was also in it. He's also the guy kind of behind the first half of the, Bergoglio pontificate, the 1415 synods, he was fading by 19 when it went to the Amazon mode. But he was there for the first four or five years. He was the guy to accomplish communion for adulterers. That was the first step of the plan. And I would just point you guys out to, point you guys at, the Cardinal Walter Brandmuller, one of the good guys, one of the dubia cardinals, 2014 statement that first it would be communion for the divorce and remarried, 
So I'll call it agenda item one. Then it would be very Prabhati and, and, um, and women deacons, agenda item two or two and three. Then it would be intercommunion with Lutherans, number four. And, um, and I've been saying ever since then, I think I've been saying this since I was on Taylor Marshall's channel, number five should be expected to be a revision of Humanae Vitae, condoms. And remember, two months before, Amoris Laetitia came out. In February of 2016, Francis said condoms are conditionally okay, contradicting 2,000-year-old Catholic teaching. They're never okay. He said it with regard to the Zika virus. The Vatican came out the next day and clarified, yes, he did mean condoms. He did say, okay, we're not backing off that. And now, since the close of the 2023 Synod, on synodality, there has been whispers that yes, Humanae Vitae study commissions are a thing Francis is interested in. So if we take that as the five-point agenda item, with a, again, a potential sixth of fiducia supplicants, which is kind of related to communion for divorce and civilly remarried, whether we're talking adulterers or Skittles men, SS unions, it's sort of the other part of it. So we got a five or six item agenda that seems to be having life breathed into it. Month in and month out here in the 12th year of the Francis number 266 pontificate. And Francis has vindicated the story even as he's trying to contradict parts of it. That's what's most important. This is real. I don't know the exact details. I don't claim to. I made a prediction during this show, uh, or I, I was having a prediction, and I said, I'll, I'll tell you if it's true, and it wasn't. Francis didn't go the direction I thought he was going to go, and I was honest about that. But I'm, I'm telling you, all, all in all, things are playing out really, really, really closely with regard to how I've anticipated. Once I got a hold on what's he doing in this pontificate after Morris Letizia came out, in April of 2016, and then it was vindicated five or six months later when he said that's the only correct interpretation. Adultery is now okay if you're a remarried divorcee. I've known where he's going. I can honestly say that. And he is going to non-sacramental deaconesses that are basically sacramental deacons. Basically. But there will be language, double-speak language in there saying, well, it's not sacramental. Deacon just means helper like it did for Susanna and Joanna. So it's very interesting, isn't it? That now he's admitting St. Colin Mafia is real. Didn't really need that, but it's an interesting show. And this is a good refresher course. I hope you found it useful. God bless you all, parish orphans and retrogrades. Amen. Deus volt.